So UK Biobank is a population cohort study that recruited half a million people uh, between 2006 and 2010. Uh, each of those individuals uh, came and gave a lot of information about themselves. Uh, they provided physical measures, they provided biological samples, and they've all come together to contribute to a research resource. And importantly, they gave consent so that we could follow their health over time. And it means that there is now an incredible resource that researchers can use from all around the world to understand why some individuals go on to develop disease and others don't. We're in the UK Biobank freezer. This is um, our robot that's doing picking for the samples for projects. So we've got 10 million samples in the freezer here. Um, overall in our resource, we've got about 17 million samples. Well, the principles really are to make the data available to as many people as possible. Um, the, the, the basis on which we recruited the participants was that their data would be available to bona fide researchers. And it doesn't matter if they're from industry, if they're academic or they're um, charitable organisations. So it's the same contractual terms that apply regardless of the status of the researcher. So samples are turned into data by um, us taking a small fraction of these samples and sending them off to um, specialist labs across the world that will assay the samples and measure particular things in the sample. That data then comes back into the resource and is made available um, for all researchers. You can imagine if you have half a million participants participants and then you're trying to capture um, genetic data and there's three different types of genetic data so genotyping, whole exome, whole genome data. Uh, we do imaging as well on uh, 100,000 of our participants and then repeat imaging on 60,000 of them and the imaging suite is four different types of imaging and you know you see how big the photos are on your phone imagine doing medical imaging it's going to be a sizable thing. And then we have survey data, we do more biomarkers, we've got people working on different types of proteomics. So 30 petabytes for now, I feel like I should put that kind of caveat of, you know, this is correct at the time of recording. And that's really where the cloud comes in uh, and this partnership between UK Biobank and AWS and, and DNA Nexus who provide our software platform that researchers use. It's all about democratisation. So enabling researchers, whether they are in a well-resourced institution in the US or an academic researcher in Africa, uh, be able to engage and analyse these data in exactly the same way. And really you can't do that in a kind of an on-premise kind of environment. You really do need to have a cloud-based approach which can scale to meet a growing range of demands and that provides the flexibility in terms of being able to introduce kind of new tools, new pipelines, new algorithms that research can start to use to really understand and get to grips with these data sets. So researchers has, have to come to the data and use it within the research analysis platform. And from our point of view, this really helps with governance because we can see what researchers are doing and we can make sure that if there's any breach of any contractual term, so anything within our contract with a researcher, we can terminate their access to the data. Multimodal data is really where UK Biobank is at. It's about how we bring these different types of data sets which uh, can be connected but also orthogonal. So going from genomic data to proteomic data to metabolomic data, how we bring that in within with linked healthcare record data that we get about participants from the NHS how we get the imaging data that we collect from our imaging centres. And it's really, uh, really about how we provide the environments through our cloud-based research analysis platform with the tooling that allows researchers to understand the relationships between these very different types of data and to see the connectivity between the two. And that will really open up uh, our understanding of kind of associations uh, between exposures uh, and then outcomes of participants that go on to develop one disease or another. What we lack at the moment is the tooling to make it easy for people to finally realise the promise of multiomics, of, of stitching that multimodal data together. And I think for me that's the next stage in democratisation of access to this data. So how do we make multimodal data easily accessible to anyone who wants to ask a health related question rather than coming and going, oh, I'm, I'm an imaging person, but this just genetic data they've got, it's, it's, I can't get through to it, I can't make use of it, even though I know it could be really helpful. Um, you add in the environmental data and that's even harder to, to try and get through because most of the people who come to us are biologists of some kind 
how, how are they supposed to get through the environmental data? I genuinely think generative AI is going to be the thing that makes that leap for people. We've got really creative researchers who are using AI techniques to enhance uh, imaging data, to turn very complex imaging data sets into more derived kind of variables that researchers can more easily consume within the uh, analyses. And I think they're going to be an important component to how researchers can start to engage uh, and analyse these data at scale, uh, taking advances in the technology which are being done at scale and bringing their own creativity to it. If we're talking about interoperability between different studies, different infrastructures, um, and, and you have to find the answer to that because when you've got 30 or more petabytes of data, moving that data around or having multiple copies is not feasible. So we need to find a way to allow scientists to do reproducible research on multiple cohorts, either at the same time or uh, indeed at different times in each of those cohorts and be able to bring the summary data together. Federation is, uh, is a really kind of interesting topic and it's absolutely kind of key. So if you look across the world, uh, this kind of patchwork quilt of similar resources, such as all of us in the US, China Kodori Biobank uh, in China, you actually want to try and have a number of these resources because the kind of participants who take part have all had a range of different uh, kind of lifestyle, environmental, genetic factors. And it's being able to look across all of these resources around the world, which is really going to kind of transform our understanding of, of many diseases. So there is this need to look at how can researchers in the kind of external community be able to take, undertake research across, say, the All of Us study and UK Biobank or Genomics England. So the cloud is a really important part because, first of all, it makes sure that these data are available, uh, kind of more accessible in secure environments that could then actually be brought together. So I think it's almost the enabling part of the whole Federation story. It's not to say, though, I think there's a lot of challenges that we still need to work through to look at just practically how do we do this at scale. I think we are on a, on a journey. I think it's going to take a few years to get there. But cloud, the standardization it provides, the scalability it provides is really kind of a foundational ingredient in making that work. I think in 20 years, UK Biobank is going to be the kind of gold standard even further than it is now in terms of what could be achieved. People will look at UK Biobank and what it will have done in 20 years time, the completeness of the data set. How do you go from something that started off with questionnaires and biological samples to something that has multimodal data that hopefully in 20 years time led the way on the use of generative AI in, in health research and opened up federated analytics across the whole of the world, across all health studies.